Hey everyone in AP Environmental. Um, I'm here to talk to you about oil, uh, only oil. So this is a non-renewable energy resource. We're going to talk about how oil is created, um, how we harvest oil, how it is used to generate electricity, and of course the pros and cons to using oil as a resource. So let's get started. So first, you must know that oil is created from protists. So these dead microscopic organisms, they sink to the bottom of a waterway and they build up and over time they get exposed to heat and pressure and they turn into oil. Um, these microscopic organisms, they are tiny so they can seep through porous rock and of course when they get to a non-porous structure, they stop moving and they kind of accumulate and build up. And so that leads to these large deposits of protists, which will eventually turn into oil. Um, oil is composed of many hydrogens and carbons. So they make these very long, what are called hydrocarbon chains. And when you put a whole bunch of those together, you get what's known as oil. All right, so there's two ways to recover oil from the ground. Um, the first is called primary and the second way is called secondary. So primary recovery is probably what you've seen in the movies. Um, the oil drillers will drill a hole down into the pool of oil and then they pump it up and they continue to pump it up until there's none left. In secondary oil recovery, what they do is they sometimes insert air or water into the well to create pressure to bring up that last remaining uh, bits of oil in the reserve. Um, I kind of liken it to a Capri Sun. If you've ever wanted to get the last bits out of a Capri Sun pouch, have you ever blown into it? And when you blow into the Capri Sun pouch, it kind of pushes the leftover Capri Sun into the straw, and then you can suck it out. So it's the same kind of idea, just in a larger context of an oil reserve. All right, so here's what some of the offshore oil platforms will look like. So oil is sometimes found in the bottom of the ocean, so we build these oil platforms to recover it if it's not on land. Um, they can be quite dangerous to work on because they are out in the middle of the ocean. They're being exposed to a whole bunch of storms and they do require constant maintenance because they are surrounded by salt water and we know what salt machines uh, do. Here is a picture of some local oil platforms that we have. So if you just cruise up 101 from Los Angeles, you'll get to Santa Barbara and they are home to um, a number of oil platforms owned by the big oil companies. All right, after you pump out the oil from the ground, you have to refine it because the crude oil is actually a mixture of a whole bunch of different hydrocarbons in different lengths. And the process that we use to refine it is usually through distillation. So you heat up the hydrocarbons and the different densities of the materials will begin to separate. So the lighter hydrocarbon chains will go to the top, the heavier ones go to the bottom, and from that, then you can separate what items you want to make your products. So this is kind of a good image that shows you um, what types of products are made from crude oil based upon the distillation process. So gasoline, that, that stuff tends to be the lightest. That's obviously used in fuel. And then you look at the bottom and you have the heavier hydrocarbon chains that are used for things like asphalt. And then of course, all the other various products that are made from crude oil. All right, uh, once you dig or pump out the oil from the ground, um, you usually have to deliver it to a refinery. Well, the refineries and the places that you drill the oil out of the ground from aren't necessarily in the same place. So you usually have to deliver the crude oil by oil tankers. Uh, so here you see pictures of the 1989 Exxon Valdez oil spill. Um, there was an oil tanker in Valdez, Alaska that was picking up oil from the Trans-Alaskan Pipeline. It hit a rocky reef and spilled all of its contents into the Pacific Ocean there. 
Um, and the reason why it was being delivered there is because the oil needed to go to ref a refinery to produce things like gasoline and asphalt. Uh, here locally, we have tons of refineries in Long Beach and San Pedro and Carson and Wilmington. These are all homes to refineries that are taking crude oil in and refining them into different products that we can use. So who has the most oil? Well, if you take a look at this picture here, you can see countries that are in black have very, very high numbers of oil reserves. Um, countries in maroon follow that with red and then orange being the highest. The countries that are in gray are um, lacking in oil reserves, and so they usually depend upon imports to get their oil. And then this is kind of a nice, easy bar graph to follow. You can see that the Persian Gulf countries definitely contain the highest amounts of oil deposits. That brings us to OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. So um, what the countries did with a lot of oil is just they decided to come together and form an organization that we call OPEC. These are the countries that are in it and what their whole goal is is to determine the price at which oil should be sold at to protect everyone's interests in the group and they also look to stabilize the prices of oils. So they work together to, um, to name the price of oil and then they sell it to different countries. Now, they do contain quite a bit of the world's crude oil reserves. So you can see this pie chart here. They pretty much organize about 80% of the world's oil. And then that leaves about 20% left over that are the non-OPEC nations. So what else goes into the price of a barrel of oil? So you might hear like, oh, right now the price of a barrel of oil is $80. So how is pricing determined? Well, number one, it really is how much oil is being pumped from the ground, right? The more oil that you're pumping from the ground, the higher supply there is, the less the price. Two, how much oil is being refined? So once you take that crude oil out of the ground, you gotta take it to a refinery and the refinery has to take it and make it into things like gasoline, right? So if the refineries are shut down because of a hurricane, for example, that happens a lot of times in Texas, um, then you can expect the price of gas, for example, to increase because the refineries aren't able to take the crude oil and turn it into gasoline. Uh, gas stations, right? They make a living, so they obviously have operational costs at the gas stations, and so they're charging a fee on top of the price of gasoline. And then keep this in mind: all of the price that you, the price that you pay at a gas station, it doesn't take into account what are called externalities. These are things, items that aren't included in the price of whatever you're buying. So for example, like air pollution, um, that obviously causes asthma and, and other associated lung problems. All of those costs that are gonna be incurred by the person who has asthma or lung problems, for example, is not included in the price of gas. With oil deposits becoming limited, um, we're looking at other sources of oil so that our industries can continue to run. And one of the things that we're looking at is called shale oil. And really, how do I look at this? It's pretty much oil in a rock. So what you do is you take the shale oil, you mine it, and in it, there's hydrocarbon chains um, called carrion. And then what you want to do with this rock is obviously grind it down and then heat it and what will happen is that the kerrigan will actually vaporize and then you can take that oil and use it in other processes just like you would by pumping it out of the ground. Um, obviously it's a little bit more energy intensive because you have to remove the oil from the rock. There's also tar sands. These are kind of big in the news lately too because Canada has a lot of tar sands. And we're looking at using this oil 
to obviously meet the demands of our energy consumption here in the United States. So what is a tar sand? Well, it is mixed, it's a mixture of clay and sand and water and this high sulfur oil called bitumen. And so what, again, kind of like the shale oil, we take this tar sand, we heat it, the bitumen, the oil will float to the surface, then we can extract that and use it for our energy resources. And then of course, um, get rid of the waste. It's very energy intensive as well as shale oil and you have to mine it just like shale oil so you have a lot of environmental destruction that comes with the mining process. Here's a picture of a tar sands operation in Canada. So you can see it's quite large and um, there's lots of habitat destruction associated with it. So why do we use crude oil? Again, number one, it's easy to transport. It's a liquid. You can load it up on things like trains or pipelines or cars, trucks, and you can transport it to the places that you need. It's also cheap. I mean, cheap in comparison to some of the other ones that we'll look at. Um, and so because it's cheap, we can continue to buy it. I think currently right now the price of gas for um, in California, in LA, so that's kind of high, is about $3.20 a gallon. So that's cheap than what some of the other sources are. It also produces a high net energy yield. So again, when you burn it, it gives off a lot of heat energy and we can use that to generate electricity or to run our machines in this industrial world. The other thing that people don't quite look at is these offshore oil platforms. Um, they, they can actually provide a lot of great habitat for organisms in the water. Um, they make artificial reefs for species that live near them. And so it provides protection, maybe a place to reproduce um, that wouldn't necessarily be there if the offshore oil platforms didn't exist. So just like any energy resource, there are disadvantages to using it. And so there are many disadvantages to using crude oil. One being that when you burn the crude oil, you combust it, it does release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. That is a greenhouse gas that does lead to global climate change as well as acid deposition because the carbon dioxide can mix with the water and it produces carbonic acid which then will leave the atmosphere and go onto the ground. A chemical that was actually added to gasoline to crude oil was called MTBE, methyl tertiary butyl ether. And it's not in gasoline anymore, which is good because it turned out to be a major groundwater pollutant, specifically here in the LA area. Well, the reason it was added to oil was to increase the efficiency of the burning of the gasoline. Um, but of course, once we put it in there, we realized later that it started making um, underwater pollution with our groundwater. It also leaked out of the underground storage tanks at the gas station. So we call those LUS, leaking underground storage tanks. Um, so all of these contribute to groundwater pollution in our area. So we stopped using it in our gasoline. Another con, you guys could probably figure this one out, is oil spill. So in transporting that oil, sometimes accidents do happen. Um, we all remember the British Petroleum Deepwater Horizon event. This is the largest oil spill that has ever happened in the history of Earth. And um, it was caused from an explosion in one of those offshore platforms, and it led to some very significant damage. Um, take a look. You, I like this map here because it kind of shows you where the oil rig was and then all the impacted areas from that oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. So what happens when you have an oil spill? How do you clean it up? Well, the first thing that usually happens is that they put what's called a boom around the oil. And this is meant to contain the oil on the surface of the water, just to kind of keep it in place, put it as a marker so that you know where the oil is. And then what happens sometimes is you get these boats called skimmer boats. They come along and they skim the oil off the top of the waterway. Remember, oil is very light and so it will rise to the top. And so it makes it very easy for skimmers to come along and scrape off the top layers of the ocean. 
Another thing that you've probably seen in commercials, yes, with all the wildlife that is covered in oil from these oil spills, uh, scientists actually do use Dawn products and soap products to remove the oil from the marine organisms. So here are some before and after pictures of a brown pelican. Um, the before was obviously a pelican that was covered in oil from an oil spill, and then you can see the resulting uh, figure afterwards. Um, another thing that happens on shore is something called high pressure washing, where literally you take high pressure water and you spray it at the oil. And then again, you have to come along and scrape the oil that was removed from the rocks. Something else that's kind of cool is a process called bioremediation, where you use living organisms to clean up um, a toxic spill. So in this case, um, there are genetically engineered bacteria that can actually be added to a waterway to break down the oil that was left from an oil spill. Another con of using crude oil, sometimes it does lead to wars. Um, a good example of that is the Gulf War of 1991. Um, I, I know there's lots of history involved here, but basically what happened is that Iraq invaded Kuwait and we were like, the United States were like, no, we can't let that happen because Kuwait supplies us with a lot of oil. So we went into Kuwait and, um, you know, obviously tried to help them and push Iraq out. We did so successfully, but on the way out, Iraq decided to light a lot of the oil fields on fire. And so we had uh, one heck of a time trying to cap the oil, um, the oil fires that were, that were in Kuwait. The last thing we're gonna talk about is an idea called peak oil. It was created by a scientist named Hubert in 1956. And it pretty much states that oil production um, is on a normal curve, okay? So kind of like the bell curve. Um, and that we will get a peak in the 1970s for oil production and then we'll be on the decline. And so currently it is thought that the U.S. did have an oil production peak at about 1971, and now we're on the slow decline of that. And, and so here's just another graphic of the Hubert curve. So you can kind of see how it looks like a normal bell curve. Um, and that concludes our talk on oil. I hope that was extremely helpful. And um, yeah, thank you for watching.